Blazing Saddles continues to delight viewers, but the makers successfully hid a wealth of mysteries. The tale of this Western satire is as crazy as the picture itself. From contentious moments that stretched comedic limits to casting choices that almost wrecked it. That the film, which could have never been created today, passed censors with its cutting edge and daring humor is even more enjoyable. Did you know that some of the most famous lines were improvised? Or that a famed comic nearly left the stage due to creative differences? You'll learn how Blazing Saddles authors matched sarcasm with sympathy to make it a timeless comedy as we explore these hidden truths. Discover Blazing Saddles' Unseen Tales, showing that the finest secrets were never filmed. Displaying a Lack of Palate or Taste Some viewers thought that the knockout punch scenario Mongo carried out was improper, even though most spectators perceived it as hilarious. Even though no horses were hurt, Many people who worked to protect animals were dissatisfied with how the horse was handled. There were no horses who sustained injuries throughout the incident. On the other hand, it was claimed that a far less violent scenario may have been devised instead of the one shown in the film. Because of this, other people would not have been able to have any preconceived notions about what they ought to do. The filmmakers were fortunate enough to work with horses that had been taught to fall on command which enabled them to capture the scenario without inflicting any injury to the animals involved. Because of this, they could avoid putting any animals in a precarious situation. There will be a fall on your part. During the second scene, the obnoxious Mongo makes the terrible mistake of parking his horse in a location where parking is not permitted. As a result, he was approached by another horse rider. Those individuals with a strong interest in films will have a distinct sense of memory about this event. After that, Mongo approached the horse with confidence and clobbered it, which led to both of them falling to the ground as a result of his actions. Following that, Mongo's actions caused them to tumble to the ground. Brooks did not just create this particular piece out of thin air. Instead, it was a real-life occurrence that he had once heard from his prior employer, Sid Caesar, who provided another source of inspiration for him. In other words, Brooks didn't create this section out of thin air. Having a fantastic time while being surrounded by the glittering stars. It should not come as a surprise that some of the performers gave their parts a significant amount of attention since the comedy film was about cowboys farts. It should not come as a surprise at all. A person that Slim Pickens yearned to be was Taggart, the leader of the bully gang who worked tirelessly to scare the residents of Rock Ridge away from their village. Taggart was someone that Slim Pickens aspired to be. Several persons, including Slim Pickens, made this dream a reality. Slim decided to sleep outdoors to thoroughly immerse himself in the mentality of his role, much as a true cowboy would do. This was done to produce the impact that was explicitly wanted. It's even more astonishing that he accomplished his feat while his Winchester was right by his side, constantly reminding him that he was an outlaw. This is in addition to the fact that he's already extraordinary. Which elements make up a name, and what are they? Even though the title was one of the most critical components of the work, the authors needed help reaching a consensus on it. However, throughout production, the title was ultimately changed to Black Bart. Initially, the working title for this film was 10X, which is a reference to Malcolm X. However, the title was ultimately changed to Black Bart. Even after making this modification, the authors continue to have a negative opinion of it, and they suggested that the name The Purple Sage be given as an alternate name that might be associated with it. After that, Brooks was showering when he suddenly had the idea for the title Blazing Saddles. He was in the middle of the shower. By the proverb, the rest, as they say, is part of history. Both he and his wife were enormous fans of it. In your struggles, make it your goal to reach the heavens. In case you can't believe it, Sheriff Bart was not a member of the particularly well-liked community. At the time, he was a contentious figure. To accomplish his goal of persuading the people who lived in the town to free him once again, he liberated him by putting a pistol on his head, which is an astonishing act. 
As a consequence of an event that took place while Brooks was still a little boy, he was the one who first came up with the concept for this. A water cannon and a pack of gum were among the items that Mel tried to take from a department store when he was a child. Despite his best efforts, he could have been more successful. The cashier was startled by little Mel, who pointed the gun at him and threatened to pull the trigger when the cashier attempted to discourage him from carrying out his plan. Little Mel's actions caused the cashier to feel uncomfortable. There is a possible presence of crickets in every single room. They believe that Brooks was capable of recreating the degree of enchantment that had created the picture of the producers. Warner Brothers was the film corporation that had this idea. When the film was initially shown, however, it was met with a hostile reception, and officials from the studios expressed their worry about how unfunny they found the film to be. Overall, the movie was not well received. Despite this, Brooks was optimistic that the movie would be a smash, and all that was required was for them to make it available to a larger audience from a public aspect. Ultimately, Warner Brothers gave up and decided to release the movie. However, they were pleasantly surprised to learn that they had been mistaken about the film based on the first released reviews. One that is not trustworthy as a studio. Brooks was in a situation where he needed to do a substantial quantity of work to persuade the studio of the potential that the film had. This was the predicament he found himself in before the film's release. The individual in charge of distribution stated, it's simply too vulgar for the people of the United States. When the president, John Kelly, decided that the movie should first be distributed in a select number of places, he said, let's dump it and take a loss. Some cities included in this group included New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. It was the most successful movie that the studio had ever produced, and it was released a few months later at the end of the summer. It was a huge hit. Individuals that are part of the Gridiron Gang As a result of Mongo's dispatch, it's quite likely that Hedley Lamar, represented by Harvey Corman, was unsuccessful in removing Sheriff Bart from his position. On the other hand, Alex Karras was a football player who had great success when he was at the height of his career. The incredible number of seasons that Karras spent playing in the National Football League is 12. His job was extraordinary in every way. Although Karras was selected for the All-Pro team nine times, he was also chosen for the All-Decades squad for the NFL in the 1960s. Both of these honors were bestowed upon him. An All-Pro member, Karras, was a member of the team. Additionally, he was selected for the Pro Bowl four consecutive times. Nevertheless, once he parted ways with the Detroit Lions, he chose to pursue a career in acting and first joined the company of Webster. He was the member of Webster's cast. Both of our names have a certain degree of resemblance. Mel Brooks decided to cast Hedley Lamar in the film Blazing Saddles because he was the most suited actor from the pool of candidates. Since this was the case, he was the ideal adversary for the film. Nevertheless, it was unfortunate that his character's name bore a noticeable similarity to a well-known actress who had been under contract with MGM from the 1930s until the 1950s. MGM had employed this actress since the 1930s up till the present. Hattie Lamar was unhappy with the parallels between the two names. Even though Harvey Corman joked that the likeness to Hattie Lamar's name may lead to a legal fight. Hattie Lamar was not pleased with the similarities. Outside of the courtroom, however, the two parties were able to come to an understanding of their differences of opinion successfully. Uninvited guests are currently present in the area. Immediately after the film's completion, Sheriff Bart and the Waco Kid are being followed across the back lot used to produce the Warner Brothers film. Reviewers generally agree that this scene is one of the most memorable passages in the movie. As soon as they enter through the gates, the suspension of disbelief is quickly destroyed, and everyone, except one individual, immediately turns towards the right. After further investigation, it was discovered that the individual in question was a random stranger who had found himself on set and was confused about how to depart. He needed help understanding the instructions for leaving the premises. Brooks permitted him to remain in the room after he had obtained his signature on the appearance. The atmosphere on Broadway is filled with a sense of magic that pervades the whole setting. Following the success of the Broadway production of The Producers, he was approached with the thought of bringing Blazing Saddles to the Great White Way theatrical stage. This came about as a result of the popularity of the Broadway production of The Producers. 
Even though Brooks knows a plan to allow him to do this, he's concerned that the risque content will no longer be tolerated. According to him, he commented, it's pretty dangerous stuff, while using the N-word in his assessment of the situation. If I were to participate in this action, I would not be hesitant, nevertheless. I am dubious about whether I could get away with it. In those days, I could stealthily escape it without being discovered. He remarked, I don't know if I could get away with it today. This was the exact phrase that followed. For my part, if I may say so myself, I would say that I... Mel Brooks has received significant attention due to his comedic performance on the television program Blazing Saddles, which has gained him positive reviews from many people. On the other hand, he couldn't help but declare that he believes it to be one of the funniest movies of all time, and he did so without considering the potential consequences that his statement may have. Brooks made a comment about the film in response to the comparison between the two films. He said, Billy Wilder's film is extremely funny, but scene for scene, there are more laughs in my movie. This was about the fact that the two films were compared. Even though it's not appropriate for me to say this, this has the potential to be the most hilarious film ever produced. I believe this to be the case. By making use of one's own resources. While casting Madeline Kahn for the part of Lily von Stupp, Brooks had his sights set on her as the appropriate candidate. Because he was confident that she could deliver hilarious lines, he set his sights on her as a potential target. However, Brooks requested to see her legs when she arrived to perform the audition for the job that the actress was auditioning for. Brooks was interested in the woman's legs. The next thing that Brooks did was explain that the character was a spoof of Marlene Dietrich, and as a result, they needed to have incredible legs. As a result of Khan's assumption that his goals were not entirely pure, she responded by saying, Oh, you're that kind of guy. Brooks then observed that Khan's assumptions were correct. On the other hand, she cautioned him, No touching! even though she understood him. One of the choices that may have made is to go from Pryor to Cleveland. Initially, Mel Brooks intended to offer the part of Sheriff Bart to the comedian Richard Pryor. However, he ultimately decided against this plan. As a result of the fact that he was rather filthy in his material and also struggled with drug addiction, which almost led to his committing himself by setting himself on fire, Pryor is an immensely controversial character. Mel was delighted with the comedian and said he was the most blessed with talent. On the other hand, Pryor is a highly controversial person. Despite all that had transpired, Brooks continued to have a strong desire for Pryor. Nevertheless, the studio suggested Cleavon Little as a replacement. After seeing Little's immaculate performance of the lines, Brooks put Cleavon in part to play the character. I'm very sorry, I'm unable to provide that. Burton Gilliam was the actor who played the role of Lyle, who was one of the many thugs that the villain used. Sheriff Bart was the subject of a racial insult that Lyle used in one of the lines that were included in the script. Burton felt uncomfortable when he sought to utilize the phrase because of its sensitive nature. Conversely, Little knew everything was about business and permitted Gilliam to continue. On the other hand, Little did make a statement that put your mind at rest about the matter. He said, if I thought you would say those words to me in any other situation, we would go to the first city. But this is all fun. When the cutting was done on the ground. Mel Brooks was a revolutionary figure in the field of comedy, and he was at the forefront of invention. This overjoyed those individuals with a sense of humor. But the studio worried about it. Mel only removed the sequence that included the most sexually explicit content, even though they asked Brooks to reduce the number of sequences. A specific occasion occurred while Bart and Lily von Stupp were in her dressing room together. During the moment where she's trying to seduce him, she turns off the light and asks, Is it true what others say about you? Bart's reaction is, I'm sorry to disappoint you, ma'am, but you're sucking on my arm. There is an effort being made to include the Duke. If you create a parody, you should make it a point to include a reference to the original. As a result of this, Mel realizes that he needs to include the legendary Western actor John Wayne in the picture. The two persons met by chance on the Warner Brothers lot, and John told Mel that he had heard about Mel's picture. Mel was surprised to learn that John had heard of the film. Mel offered to create a short piece for Wayne, was finally turned down by John, who said, Now, I can't do a movie like that, but I'll be first in line to see it. Ultimately, Mel's offer was not accepted for consideration. 
Exactly what does it imply when someone says quid pro quo? During the early stages of their working relationship, Mel and the renowned Gene Wilder, who was an excellent comic, began working together on a short film called The Producers. Wilder contracted Mel to cast Gene in Blazing Saddles when Mel expressed interest. If Brooks were to review a screenplay that Gene had begun writing and turn it into a picture, Gene said he would be willing to appear in Mel's project. Mel agreed. Which script is it? It was for the picture Young Frankenstein, nominated for an Academy Award. Who was it that the gas traveled through? Mel's comedy often takes the form of slapstick and is always hilarious. People have been seen falling, hitting their heads on windowsills, and overall being wounded as a result of his actions. Additionally, he was a pioneer in the field of another slapstick humor, which was the use of farting noises in the film Blazing Saddles. In the notorious film, cowboys are seen lounging around a campfire, eating baked beans and sipping coffee. This is a reference to a common stereotype. Mel thought it was unavoidable for the cowboys' bellies to rumble, and he decided to make it happen on screen. In the realm of music, there exists unfinished truths. You may sometimes have to tell a little white lie to obtain what you want. One of the things that Mel Brooks did to Frankie Lane, the composer of the music for Blazing Saddles, was to do just this. Over 75 years, Lane had been a singer and composer. This is longer than some people even live. At the beginning of his career as a composer, Lane thought that the Western was more of a dramatic genre than a parody. Mel did not disclose to Lane that the film was a comedy because Brooks was concerned that Lane might alter the song if he knew from the beginning that the film was humorous. The appearance that shocked everyone even more than any other. In the case of this specific film, however, attendees arrived on horseback to connect with the idea of the film. It's generally known that movie premieres are glamorous, replete with A-listers getting out of magnificent limos, and wearing the most expensive custom suits they've ever worn. Covert allusions to it that have been made. While developing the screenplay for Blazing Saddles, Mel Brooks meticulously considered every word. Every word was written with a specific purpose, whether it would make you laugh, weep, or add something to the story. As an excellent illustration, consider the scenario in which Mongo comes into town on his horse, and you overhear a Mexican guy screaming, Mongo! This phrase is a tribute to Mango Santa Maria, a well-known Cuban jazz artist, and Brooks inserted it explicitly to do so to achieve the goal of making an apparent reference to him. It's Santa Maria! Along with Mel Brooks, it's feasible to sing along with him. There is a brief moment in the scene at the film's end when Hedley Lamar and his men ride into a fake town that the sheriff and the Waco Kid created. During this little moment, the camera takes a break from the action that's taking place. While they're making their way into town, Lily von Stupp and many German soldiers are recording themselves performing a drinking song. Following that, the camera moves to reveal them. The drinking song they were singing was the same one that Gene Wilder, Zero Mostro, and Kenneth Mars performed by themselves during the producers. The melody that they were singing was identical. A delectable chocolate-covered confection that's good for one's life and is sure to entice. In this specific instance, once Harvey Corman stops at the movie theater at the end of the film to buy some concessions, product placement in the film may go a long way. And this was the case on this particular occasion. Amid all the turmoil, he chose to stop and buy a box of raisinets. He did this while standing in the middle of the chaos. Brooks noted that the adoption of this choice led to an increase in product sales. In 1975, he gave an interview to Playboy magazine, and the following is an extract from that conversation. We mentioned Raisinets and Blazing Saddles, and now the company sends me a gross of them every month. The Raisinets are all over the place. Make it known to the whole world in a crowd. Because there were so many people fighting to have their ideas integrated into the film, the process of drafting the script for Blazing Saddles was more challenging than one may have expected it would be. Blazing Saddles was more or less written in the middle of a drunken fistfight, Brooks, the novel's author, said. Blazing Saddles, there were five of us, and we were all yelling at the top of our voices to be featured in the movie. We wanted our ideas to be included in the film. I was lucky enough to have the ability to pick what was included and what was left out, in addition to being the most vociferous candidate for the position of director. 
This conflict in Waco casting is a defeat in terms of casting. Given that Gene Wilder played the iconic Waco kid in the comedy, it's impossible to imagine anybody else portraying the role. This is because Gene Wilder was the only person who ever played the part. Despite this, Brooks first offered employment to several other artists, including Johnny Carson, who was one of them. As a result of the host of the late-night television program declining the post, Gig Young was presented with the chance to assume the role. It would seem that his problems with drinking outside of the set hindered his performance on set, even though he intended to play the drunken Waco kid in the movie. Consequently, he was ultimately removed from the post, and Wilder was chosen to take his place. The Presence of a Franchise That Did Not Already Exist in the Real World In addition to being one of the most significant contributors to the success of Blazing Saddles, the amusing screenplay that Andrew Bergman authored was also an important consideration. After achieving such a high degree of fame, his work was used to develop new material, such as the television series Black Bart. His work was also used in the production of other content. Louis Gossett Jr. portrayed Bart in the first episode of the series, which was shown on television for the first time on April 4, 1975. Unbelievably, the program continued to record, even though it was never broadcast to the broader public. This phenomenon is beyond comprehension. The reason for this was that the program was being produced in compliance with the terms of the contract that stated it. Incorporating a Comedic Mastermind Individual into the Organization While Brooks was working on the script for Blazing Saddles, he was also designing a television show that was going to be called Your Program of Shows. Both of these endeavors were going on at the same time. When he was in New York, namely after seeing Richard Pryor perform at the Vanguard nightclub on a particular occasion, he was struck with the idea that would later become his inspiration. Upon their first encounter, the comic and Pryor struck up an instantaneous connection, which resulted in Brooks casting Pryor in a role in the film. After that, as the saying goes, history was written, and Pryor was the genius behind the endeavor's success. He's responsible for writing the bulk of Mongo's dialogue. A fact about Mel Brooks that's hard to believe. At the same time Mel Brooks started working on Blazing Saddles and his son Max was born, these two events happened simultaneously. Due to the limited financial resources that Brooks had available, he felt compelled to ensure the movie's success. When he took on a project only for financial gain, even though he didn't want to seem like a sellout, he said that he felt like Charles Dickens. He said this because he did not wish to appear sold out. How to Achieve a Fart As Brooks gave careful thought to every word and reference in his script, he was fully aware of what he was doing when he included more than one reference to farts in the movie. In other words, he was conscious of what he was doing. It was Joseph Pujol, a flatulence artist who acted under the stage name La Petomaine, who served as the idea for the part of Governor La Petomaine, which he portrayed in the performance. Since the French performer had such strong abdominal muscles, he could expel gas any time he was instructed. This talent allowed him to execute extraordinary feats. The term Peter in French means fart, and the suffix main means maniac. Together, these two words make the nickname Fart Maniac. His name is Fart Maniac. To be considered for an Academy Award Films deemed to have significantly impacted the world are honored by the Academy Awards, which are given out annually. Because, in general, these films are profoundly moving and emotionally charged, and they affect people deeply, it's not unexpected that Mel Brooks and the Blazing Saddles performers did not imagine their comedy film parody would be nominated for an Academy Award. It's not surprising at all. A stroke of good luck for them was that Madeline Kahn was nominated for the prize of Best Supporting Actress for her portrayal of Lily von Stupp. This turned out to be a fortunate turn of events. Even though she did not end up winning, the fact that she was placed on the list was a tremendous acknowledgement. Execution of the impersonation is quite good. There is a significant possibility that you're already familiar with George Gabby Hayes if you're slightly interested in Western films. This is because there's a substantial likelihood that you've seen him in some films. Gabby was an outstanding performer with an impressive set of skills. Throughout his career, he was regarded as one of the most influential figures in the Western genre. While Mel Brooks searched for a suitable substitute for Gabby, 
He stumbled across the actor Jack Starrett. They became friends. He quickly concluded that Starrett was the most appropriate candidate for the post. Because of this, Jack was chosen to portray the role that was first offered to him. It was Brooks who indicated to Jack that he wished for Jack to plan. Customers who were already well-known Several admirers worldwide reached out to Mel Brooks to express their appreciation and enthusiasm for the movie Blazing Saddles he directed. On the other hand, the response from a particular admirer has caused him to have a greater sense of being overwhelmed than any other admirer. Following the news that the legendary filmmaker Alfred Hitchcock had seen his film, Brooks was anxious to get any feedback that might be supplied about the film. The fact that Hitchcock appreciated it is astounding. Hitchcock had a tremendous deal of pleasure with the storyline and the production, even though their approach to production was distinct, just the right kind of compliment. Having no pockets in existence In New York, New York, Mel Brooks and his gang of writers formed their studio in an office on the sixth story inside a Fifth Avenue building. Although the six writers put in a lot of effort to polish and perfect the screenplay and produce the movie that we all know and love today, Mel Brooks was the only one who earned remuneration for his services. This is even though the six authors worked together to make the movie. The fact that Brooks walked away with a nifty $50,000 while the rest of the people walked away with empty wallets is the subject of great unhappiness. The Consolidation of Existing Relationships it's impossible to overstate the significance of Mel Brooks' connection with John C. Howard, who is well-recognized as a film editor. Among the most influential people in Hollywood, Mel Brooks has established relations with several of them. They've worked together on producing several films that Brooks has directed, and he even participated in the editing of Blazing Saddles. During their time together, they've contributed to those films. Throughout their trip, Howard offered Brooks some advice, leading him to acquire one of the most spectacular photographs to edit. Then they went their way and carried out their responsibilities in perfect harmony. This ended up being just what we needed. Known as Mr. Max, Mel's small child. The following paragraphs present one of the most amazing facts that many people probably haven't noticed. Mel Brooks' son, Max Brooks, was born around the time Mel was working on the script for the movie. Max Brooks is named after his biological father. If you're not aware, Max Brooks is the author of the well-known novel World War Z. Who knows, maybe the brilliance and specific writing talents of Blazing Saddles were handed on to Max when he was born, and that's what finally enabled him to become a well-known writer with his name. Please know about this. Bart is a persona that Mufasa portrays in the role of Bart. It's pretty impossible to imagine anybody else playing the position of Sheriff Black Bart, except Cleavon Little, since we're all familiar with the persona of Black Bart. The fact that James Earl Jones, another outstanding actor, was considered for the part of Black Bart is an exciting piece of information to uncover. Jones has provided the voice of Mufasa, the strong character in The Lion King, and Darth Vader, the antagonist in Star Wars. These roles have brought Jones the most recognition at present. The idea is incomprehensible to us, but it would have been an entirely different movie if it had been done so. Performances of humorous comedy rooted in the United States This fascinating fact is not so much about what happens behind the scenes as it is a piece of information that some people need to be aware of, even though they ought to be mindful of. This is rather interesting. The American Picture Institute named the picture the sixth finest American comedy of all time in the year 2000. If you're a diehard fan of Blazing Saddles, you'll be thrilled that the film was ranked as the sixth best American comedy ever. The American Film Institute is the organization that granted this honor for artists' work. Further information is that Mike Bloomberg, who once served as the mayor of New York City, said it's his all-time favorite film. Every single one of the references to the culture there will always be a one-of-a-kind interaction between the person who developed the movie and the person who views it, and this will occur every time a film is produced. According to Brooks, I always thought the audience would be as smart as the filmmakers. He predicted that people would understand the many cultural references in the film. When Black Bart delivers the Agincourt speech from Shakespeare's Henry V with an interpolated tune from Cole Porter's You Do Something To Me, he's probably accurate most of the time. 
But concerning this specific reference, he's not correct. That's the starting point of everything. However, even though we've been revealing a great deal of information on the happenings behind the scenes after the filming began, we've yet to release the method by which the overall idea of the movie was formed. The beginning of everything started when Mel Brooks was walking around the streets of New York trying to think of ideas for his next blockbuster movie. This was the beginning of everything. Even though he had just finished working on the producers and the 12 chairs, the money he had received from both projects needed to be improved, and he desperately needed financial assistance. At that very instant, he became conscious of a voice declaring, Mel. Several long-lost companions from the past. It was revealed that the mysterious voice that had called his name out on the street was David Bagelman, the founder of the talent firm Creative Management Associates. This revelation came as a complete surprise to everyone. Furthermore, David offered Mel an offer to join him for lunch, citing that the two had been friends for a considerable time. After that, he went on to explain that he had a preliminary draft of a project that was going to be titled Ted X. David was confused about what to do with it, and he considered that the movie concept had a Mel Brooks feel to it. He went on to say that he had a primary draft of the project. To fulfill his obligations, he was required to generate his writing. The opportunity presented itself to Brooks, who was in dire need of a break and a method to earn some money, and he decided to seize the opportunity and take on the work. The only caveat was that he insisted on authoring the script for the movie himself. Even though he would later use the services of additional writers, he insisted on being the principal writer for the film. At some point in the future, the film's title will be changed from TEDx to Black Bart, then it will be changed to Blazing Saddles after the process. It's fascinating to think about the success that may have accomplished if the name had not been changed significantly after it was first chosen. The name of this card game is Musical Chairs with Music. Brooks has always been a creative genius when it comes to doing things in a manner that's not conventional. He's always shown his ability. This was relevant when he planned to use music in the foreground rather than playing music in the background, which is a much more common approach. As a result, he decided to work with Count Basie. He's usually regarded as one of the most outstanding band leaders and is now accessible. He made use of Basie and his band to play the song April in Paris in the movie so that the audience might hear it. Brooks was also responsible for penning the theme song for the film, which Frankie Lane finally recorded. This is a remarkable turn of events that occurred throughout the film. Is there anything that you could consume that would make it easier for you to go to sleep? Ted Ashley, the chief executive officer of Warner Brothers, voiced his displeasure with the choice after Brooks had presented the film to the company. Ashley surrounded Brooks and gave him the following orders. You have to do the following. Take out the N-word, take out the bean scene, punching a horse, the Lily Von Stupp, and the black sheriff saying something along the lines of, you're sucking on my arm, or any other similar phrase. Brooks' response was, great, everything has to be thrown out the window. When he was told, they're all out, he did not comply with the command, instead throwing away all the notes and leaving. He did not comply with the instructions. In your case, it's finished. Madeline Kahn had already been cast in the character of Mame in the film adaptation of the book Blazing Saddles for the beginning of the filming of the film adaptation for the novel. Lucille Ball and B. Arthur were scheduled to appear in the production of Mame, which was a musical that was being adapted from the Broadway musical of the same name. Just one day before Madeline was scheduled to begin her work on Blazing Saddles, she was fired from her post at MAME. Ball alleged that Khan had meant to be fired by delivering a terrible performance to free herself up to focus on performing the character of Lily von Stupp. This was Ball's assertion. To obtain the rejection When the initial round of shooting was being done, Gig Young played the part of the Waco Kid, in one of the earliest scenes that was recorded, the Waco kid was shown hanging from his bed while he was drunk and berating Bart. This was one of the moments that was captured. It's possible that after watching the video, you'd get the idea that Young is an outstanding actor because he plays intoxication so convincingly. On the other hand, he was inebriated to the point that production had to be suspended. Gene Wilder was appointed as the new head coach after Gig was terminated from his position. After many years had passed, Young initiated legal action against the studio, claiming that they had breached the terms of his contract. There was never a time when it was included in the script. One statement stood out from the rest. 
even though the comedy was renowned for its brilliantly designed lines that were humorous, in reaction to the hatred that the residents of the town show against Bart, Waco Kid provides him some comfort by saying, you have to keep in mind that these are regular farmers. According to Waco Kid, these farmers are the land's original inhabitants. It's one of the usual types of clay that may be found in the New West. The word, you know, morons, was the last part of the remark that was imported. And it was the word, you know, and the phrase morons that led Cleavon Little to shed genuine tears of entertainment. If you've watched the video till here, that means you've enjoyed the video. Subscribe. Don't forget to turn on the notifications bell icon 